Hello and welcome to the heart of the matter. My name is Omotayo. Now on today's episode, we're sitting down with Mrs. Asata Orwell Brown, a Liberian refugee who moved to Nigeria when she was still in her teenage years and has lived through IDP camps, refugee camps, and has managed to find a way to become a successful CEO of a catering company called Ganador Catering. She has a deep emotional story to share with us that I hope will really encourage and inspire you. And if you stick around to the end of the episode, there just might be a giveaway in there for you. So don't go anywhere, we will be right back. Welcome back to the heart of the matter. We are here with our amazing guest, Asata Orwell Brown. Hmm. I am so excited to have this conversation. How are you? How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. Yeah, very how are you feeling? Well. I feel excited. Yeah? Mm -hmm. It's like the story that you have is such a powerful story. It's like it's been burning up for you to just share it with the world. Yeah. Are you ready? I am. Okay, cool. Well, before we jump right in, you are the CEO of Canada Kitchen. Canada Kitchen. So CEO yeah. is right. Yeah. Yes, amazing. I love it. I love it. And even the story of how that came about is part of this whole conversation. I'm telling you. Yeah. All right, so let's start from the beginning. Let's just dive in. Tell us about how you got to come to Lagos and where you're from. Hmm. Yes. <laughs> My name is Asata. Yes. And I'm a Liberian mm. from Liberia. <laughs> and, um, I came into Nigeria due to the Civil War. Mm. Actually, that took place in um, Liberia for over 20 years. Mm. You know, it was, it was tough. It was hard. And then when the war started, what I remember was that I was born into the world, actually. Like while the war was going on was when yes, you were born? Yes, I was born into the world. No, 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 sorry. I was born three years before the war actually started. Right, OK. So I grew up. In, in the war. Right. And uh, I remember very well, 1996, I can never forget because then, you know, I was, um, say, between seven to eight years old. So I could remember things. Mm. And we just heard this heavy, you know, gunshot. And my dad tried to turn on the radio and the news went on. Rebels are coming and they're coming to attack where we were and we had to move. Mm. Before we could even start to move, they had already come. We were too late. Wow. And then they attacked our community. Wow. When they attacked our community, we didn't even have the time to plan. We didn't have the time to take anything with us. Wow. And we just started running. Mm. My dad, my siblings, cousins who used to live with us, myself, my mom, our neighbors, and we just started running. Mm. Where to? Nobody knew. Mm. And we started moving from one community to another. With nothing, we left everything behind because the rebels had already attacked us. Wow. And there was no time to look for anything. And then we moved on to another community. Before we could even settle down, you know, it was as if they I kept following in, right. at every point. Mm. And then we keep moving from community to community, from community to community, and then we landed in another country. Mm. Yeah. So the nearest country to us was Sierra Leone. Right. Moving from one community to another, then we found ourselves in Sierra Leone, and all these were by foot. Wow. And how long, how many years, how many weeks, months did this take? Six weeks, eight weeks, wow. ten weeks. We were just moving, wow. looking for, you know, where we could just find peace. Right. And then how did you then get to Nigeria? We moved to Sierra Leone, from Sierra Leone to Senegal, mm. from Senegal to Mali, wow. from Mali to Africa Coast, wow. from Africa Coast to Ghana, from Ghana to Nigeria. Mm. And then when you shared the story before, you talked about how you lived in the IDP camps oh, in these yes. countries. So that, 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 that's another story that always makes me cry when I think mm -hmm. about it because throughout the movement, you know, in fact, my elder sister, during this period, mm -hmm. my elder sister got missing. Oh, wow. Till now, we don't know her whereabouts. Oh, wow. So we were kept in an unfinished building mm -hmm. looking for food. 
Yeah. And then, you know, another group of people came telling mm -hmm. us that um, at the wharf, the United yes. Nations have brought uh, um, food. food right. So people who can make it down to the wharf to actually go and, and get, get food. food. And then that's how my elder sister went to oh, look for wow. food for us. She never came back. Wow. In that process, my parents too also went to look for food. That was another day. And then another attack happened where wow. they kept me. Wow. So when the attack happened, I disappeared. Mm. So I was just roaming about, living on the streets, you know. No parents at that moment. Wow. No one. I eventually connected with them. Mm. But I mean, just that period, I was, like just, I was, was just on the streets. Say maybe for three months. Wow. Just roaming about. Thankfully, nobody killed me. <laughs> but I was just there. Yeah. You know, a lost child. Walking up and down, yeah. innocently, just, just, innocent. just looking for food to eat. Mm. And know. all this while, there were still wars, still rebels, oh, yes. still fighting. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And then, so tell me about the decision you made to come to Nigeria and how did you do all that? Right, so when I eventually connected with my folks, yes. we moved on again. Mm -hmm. Then we eventually landed in Ghana. Okay. So Ghana had this refugee camp that was established by the United Nations. Okay. The camp is called Buduburam, okay. Buduburam Refugee Camp. Okay. And then we were in the camp. The camp was just there. Mm. No life. Mm. So we had this set of um, Liberian girls who mm. just felt, okay, since this is where they decided to keep, keep us, mm -hmm. let's see how we can uh, make life useful for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And then some of them started moving on into town. Some of them started, you know, going into all, all sort of things, things just to keep body and soul together. In the morning, you just wake up, it's the same thing. Mm. Morning and night, no life. So that you had no activities, you no had No activities, nothing. nothing. Just waiting for UN to bring you food. You mm. couldn't even go into Accra to work mm. because it was really, really tough. And then, you know, we had this refugee status, you right. know, attached to us. So it's no like one wants to even give you a job, right? right? We were just there. Hmm. We were just there, what waiting the, for UN. What was this camp like? Because even you saying this now, I realize that when we think about people in camps, in refugee camps, we just we don't think about life there. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, if, even if you're at home on holiday, you have books to read, you can go and see your friends, you can do activities, but you're saying there was nothing. Nothing like that. Because, mm -hmm. you know, we, we were just there with this mindset of, you know, you got people thinking about how their parents left them, yeah. how their families left them, yeah. where could they be by now, right. people who got their parents killed during the process. Right. You know, so there were, we, we, you know, lots of rehabilitation, you know. Yes. So people were not even interested in making life useful. Right. So all we do is just wake up in the morning and eat, mm. wait for the UN food to arrive. No life, to be no honest, life. no life. People started establishing, establishing churches, yeah. Mm. Started developing schools in the community. Okay. But I mean, no one really cared to, still, to go. Right. They, they tried to make, you and tried to make life comfortable, but it was, but it it was, was never like still just being at home. Yes. yes, and then we were just in the four walls of that camp. Mm. That was the most irritating thing. Right. You can't go out. Mm. Were you not allowed to? You were allowed to, but I mean, even when you go going? out, the kind of eyes they look at you with. Mm. I'm like, don't come and bring war into our right. country. So wow. no one wants to associate with you. Oh, wow. You know? And I just told myself, I don't think I want to continue like this. What's mm. the way forward? Mm. There was another camp that was established in Nigeria. Right. Still by UNHCR. Okay. But I don't know what was different mm. about the camp in Nigeria right. and the camp in Ghana. Right. We just found out that some of the refugees who even used to come on holiday mm. looked better, mm. had a better life, mm. and then we started asking, how is it going on over there, mm. you know? And then I met a friend who came to see my dad and told me that he saw my uncle, mm. uncle that I haven't seen since the war started. Oh, wow. So this uncle that I had in Nigeria, yeah. you know, eventually found his way here somehow right. and started working. Right. 
So I wrote a letter when my friend was going back to Nigeria mm -hmm. asking that I'd like to come and see Nigeria. I'd like to come mm. and see my uncle, right. you know. And then the letter went, waited for months, no feedback. Mm. And then my friend came back again, I think after six or eight months, right. and told me that, oh, yeah, so my letter was delivered mm. and all that and all that. Uh, this is my uncle's phone number yeah. and I can reach him. Mm. So I started calling. And he was like, oh, yeah, so I can come to Nigeria if I want to. But mm. he has just one more month in Nigeria because mm. the contract he was doing right. is he over. So if I like, I can come for the one month and just see right. how, how right. Nigeria is. Right. I was so excited. I didn't even have money mm. to come in the first place. So my mother, who used to sell, you know, donuts mm. and um, puff puff mm. in the community, right. gather all her little change mm. and then transported me to come and see my uncle. Mm. So I came. Mm. When I came, my uncle told me everything, you know, that he'll be going back. He just want me to come and see how the place is and mm -hmm. I should go back to my parents. Mm -hmm. But then I made use of the one month. Mm. I started making friends around mm. and I saw that there was just something different about Nigeria. Mm. I'm not saying it because I'm here, but yeah. there was just something different, yeah. you know, that I started seeing, I started mm. receiving that I never got when I was back in Ghana. Right. So when my uncle told me to leave, I told him no problem. I'll leave, but I'll come back. It's like, not for me. Uh, if you want to come back, you have to come back, come back on your own. I said, no problem. And then I left. So I, I went back to my parents and I told mm. them, I said, the life in Nigeria mm. <laughs> seemed better than the life in Ghana here. Mm. We're just here. We're not going to school. Mm. In fact, we even used to have people come from Accra to carry girls from our camp. And I just told myself, I don't think I want to be involved in this. Right. So you had my age mates who started having three children, right. four children. Teenage pregnancy was at its peak. Wow. And I just looked at my life because I was a teenager. Then I thought, mm. I, I, I'm not ready for this. Right. I'm not even interested. So what's the way forward, Lord? Mm. Just lead me, you know. Mm. And I decided to come back. Mm. My parents cried. <laughs> My mom was worried. Who do imagine. you know? You don't know anybody. You only went for one month. Yes. And you want to go back? And I remember telling her that she shouldn't worry. I'll be fine. Mm. You know, and she reminded me about my sister who had gone. And she was like, you're the only one I have. And you want to leave me to go where? And I told her I had to go make my living because I couldn't survive in Ghana. And I came. Mm. When I came, that's when my journey to manifestation began because mm. it wasn't easy, I must admit. But Can I get tissue, please? Thank you. It wasn't easy because I came, I came with no hope at all. I didn't know where to start from. I just came. And when I came, I tried to connect with people at the Liberian refugee camp. Yeah. It was as if um, the, 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 the contract with UN and Nigeria was already over. Wow. So UN was repatriating people back home. Oh, right. You know, people they could um, take to wherever they wanted to take them. Yeah. In fact, some UN even established a, a program. Mm. You know, so they were taking some of the refugees to Norway, to Australia. So people who were Fortunate, they mm. just selected randomly. Right. People who were fortunate, they managed to travel abroad, you know, right. and then the program closed. Oh, wow. So I didn't even have the chance again to enter into the refugee camp. Mm. And then I went to the, to the embassy to report myself yeah. that um, this is a citizen who doesn't even know doesn't her way anything. through. So any help I can get from anybody would be, would be very mm -hmm. useful, That's you know. Cool. Then I, I connected with a friend who I met mm -hmm. when I came the first time. Yeah. I don't know if it's okay for me to call her name. In fact, you know what? <laughs> Hold on at this, the point of this friend. We want to dig deep in. I want to give you a moment to just refresh and then we can continue the conversation, right? So we're going to go on a quick break and okay. then we'll come back and we'll pick up exactly where you are. All right. Oof. Stick around. We'll be right back. <laughs>
Welcome back to the heart of the matter, Asata. Yes. Let's continue your, your story. So you got to Lagos. Yes, I got to Lagos. Connected with connected friend. my friend and I told her I need her to host me because mm. I'm back to stay for good. Was she one of the friends you met the last time? Yes, the last time I right. came to stay with my uncle. Mm. I was just like, you, you're back to stay for good? How? Mm. For you told me your uncle is gone. I'm like, yes, mm. but I need your help. Mm. She was like, okay, she has to speak with her parents first mm, and let's see what happens. So she spoke with her elder sister and they said, okay, they could accommodate me but for a short while. Mm. I started living with them. Mm. Then one day the mom just told me, I don't know you. Mm. You have to leave. How long had you been then, there at the time? Maybe two months. Okay. I don't know you, you have to leave. Mm. My daughter just picked you up from the street. Mm. You have no background. You have no family. Wow. I can't connect you with anyone. Mm. So you please, you have to leave. I'm mm. sorry we can't help you. Wow. Well, in those two months, what, what did you do? Were you able to? I was just looking for a job. Right. So I wasn't doing anything, basically. I was just, yeah. you know, holding on to her wherever she goes. Right. I follow and all that, trying to right. know my environment, yeah. mm. you know. And I left. Mm. And you were in Lagos. I was in Lagos. Right. And I left. Mm. I left to where? Nowhere. I had wow. no idea. And I just left. Then I started sleeping on the streets of Lagos. Wow. Wow. Many times I slept in the bar in there. Mm. Mm -hmm. Because there was nowhere to go. Nobody to talk to. Mm. Then she told me about her church. Mm. And then I visited the church. Mm. When I visited the church, we used to use that opportunity to meet. So... Sometimes I would trek from wherever I've spent the night mm. down to the church and right. then just trying to meet up with her and right. ask her what's the way forward, mm. who do you know can help. Right. Then because even my English wasn't even good. I couldn't speak well. How did well. you learn English? <laughs> We're going to get there. <laughs> I couldn't even speak good English. Mm. If I'm talking to people, they'll have to ask me maybe like four or five times wow. just to be sure of what, what I said. Saying. So, uh, no qualification, nothing whatsoever. The only job that was avail available at that moment for me, mm -hmm. which was my best bet, mm -hmm. was to be a nanny, mm. a house girl. Mm. I didn't even hesitate when mm. that came my way. I was so super excited. Why? I had food to eat. Right. Great. And accommodation. Food that I don't even see. Mm. In a day, if I'm able to get one biscuit, I'm fine. Mm. Right? Mm. And I'm going to be a house girl somewhere. Mm. I'm going to have shelter. Right. And they will give me food. Oh, fantastic. What mm. a great job. I'm ready. Right. And then I started. Mm. So that was my major work. Right. I worked with a couple of families, mm. taking care of their homes, taking care of their babies, their children. Some families, mm, super nice. Mm. Other families, well, mm. <laughs> glory to God that I'm still alive. <laughs> wow, I can imagine. <laughs> because sometimes I used to receive the beating of my life. Wow. I just break a glass cup, I'm dead. Wow. How much was my money? Mm. You know, that I have to go and pay for the glass for cup. The glass. Sometimes I will have heaps of clothes that I need to wash. Mm. And I will, meanwhile, there was washing machine in the house. Wow. Wow. But at least my madam saw that, ah, this girl is very strong and she can mm. wash clothes very well. I so think you should works. wash my outing clothes and my husband's clothes and the mm. children's clothes. So the beddings and towels will just, you know, use the use machine. The machine. So I was doing all sorts of things. I will cook, I will clean the house, I will take care of the children, I will wash, I was the laundry woman, I was everything. Mm. In fact, there's this particular family I had that used to rotate me. How, what do you mean? Oh. So <laughs> my madam will use me for this mom. Mm -hmm. And then maybe the sister would call, that your girl. Mm. I think I like her. Mm. <laughs> when she's even working, she doesn't even complain. Mm. Please, can she come and do right. one week with me? Right. And then I will go round. They will rotate me wow. in their families. I will just be working. Mm. Doing all this, I will still myself. Mm. Happy, suffering, mm. but happy. Yeah. I remember vividly, I speak with my parents on the phone and I... I pretend as if everything mm. is fine. In fact, I was just going to ask, how did they, how did they feel? 
didn't, didn't give them any reason to think that I was ever suffering. Right. Or I didn't have anywhere to stay. Right. Or I stayed on the streets. Mm. Or I hawked things in Lagos. Mm. Or I was doing a house catch. I'd never give them any reason. Right. My salaries I saved. I sent to them. Wow. I keep the rest to take care of myself. Right. You know. Mm. And then there was this particular family I lived with. Mm -hmm. It was really hard because I'll say my madam was awesome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> awesome because she used to really deal with me. Mm. Awesome, not awesome, awesome, yeah. fantastic, but. But what's awesome? Awesome, <laughs> awesome in, because the, in the name that, of Jesus. <laughs> thank you, because through the process, you mm. know, that molded me and made me who I am today. Right. That's why I like using the word that those people were awesome, mm. because God actually sent me to them to make me who I am today. Mm. The strong woman, the courageous person that I knew yes. I am, yeah. you know. So there was this uh, family friend who used to come to visit. Mm, I really like this part of your story because it's like in the, in the toughest place. In the midst of the storm. God sent someone. Yes. Please go on with that. After all the long sufferings, you know, I met this last family that I lived with. I was managing myself because sometimes the beatings, the insults, the shouts, and everything. Then there was this family friend who used to come to visit. And then he always watched me. Mm. When he comes into the house, the kind of reception I gave him, you know, I'm always smiling, mm. I'm always working, I'm always looking for who to talk to. Right. And then he picked interest in me, and mm. he, he asked me one day, where are you from, who are you? And I told him, I'm a Liberian. Mm. How did you come to Lagos? Mm. I told him about the story of the war. Right. It's like, what's your name? Mm. I told him my full name. Apparently, he knew my uncle. Your uncle, the same uncle? Yes. Wow. He knew my uncle. Wow. And he just took interest in me. Mm. Then he told my madam, this girl doesn't look like a maid. Mm. I think you should do something about it. Mm. And if you don't, I'm going to pray about it. Mm. And whatever God says, I will follow. Mm. So we left it there. Yeah. For about a month or two, right. he still kept on coming, mm. asking me, interrogating me, right. wanting to know more about me. And he saw that I wasn't even in school. Mm. I wasn't even attending any lesson How whatsoever you at to time? help myself. Say 15? Wow. 15, okay. 16, right. there about. And then he told my madam one day that uh, he has prayed about my situation and God has told him that um, the female child that he doesn't have, it's me. Wow. Wow. So he's asking my madam to please get another maid. Wow. Because he's going to adopt me. Wow. I didn't know about this. Hmm. And then he came to the house one day and he said it openly. Mm. He called her and was like, what I told you about, I think uh, I'm ready it's to take time. my daughter, so. Wow. Go and look for someone else. Mm. Then I don't know how the discussion happened behind yeah. closed doors, but what I remembered was that my breakthrough came from there. Mm. And I was picked from that home into my new father's home. He loved me so much so that when I even do things, you know, that a regular child would have done, yeah. he corrects me with so much love and he mm. makes me to understand the process of adoption. Mm. And he always spoke to me, preached to me, made me to understand that God was the one who led him mm. to adopt to me. Adopt you. He didn't just do it on his own. So. Right. I should learn how to love. I should learn how to be open. Mm. So whatever the situation is, mm. you know. Wow. He took me, picked me up, sent me to school. I started with lesson. Wow. You know. And then, is that when you started learning to speak English That's properly? That's when I started learning how to speak wow. English properly. Wow. So I started going to lessons, different lessons, writing different exams. Mm. You know, it was strange to me because <laughs> I can't imagine. In fact, this part of the story is so powerful because when you said 
he took you as his. It reminds me of the picture of adoption. When we talk about in the Bible yeah. that we're adopted, that God adopted us, mm -hmm. so we're no longer slaves. We're yeah. now sons, own, and daughters, sons and daughters. We can call Christ. him Father. Father. And it's like, we, we, we can't always understand what that looks like, but you've yeah. lived it, so you, you I've can see it. it. Yes. I've experienced it. I can't think of any time, mm. all through that I lived with him till I got married, I can't think of any time that he did me any wrong. Wow. wow. Whatever he did to me that made me cry was for my good. Mm. He corrected me with love. Mm. Things that he will buy for his children, he will buy for me. Mm. When he's going to have Christmas, you know, holiday with his family, yeah. I am there. Right. If not because of the height difference, <laughs> he's very tall <laughs> and huge. Right. You will never know that I'm not his child. Wow. Never. Wow. Never. Wow. And then he took me, cleaned me up, changed my life, changed wow. my story. Wow. Started my lessons, started writing exams. Before you know it, I was already in the university. Wow. My life changed. I had my own room to myself. <laughs> <laughs> what did you study in the university? History. Wow, my dad wanted me to study history. Really? I didn't. <laughs> I studied history with the mindset of going back home. Right. And international relations. Right. With the mindset of going back home, but then... Yeah, still here. I'm still here. <laughs> Join us next week for the concluding part of this episode. So at your wedding, your dad was there. Yes, yeah, so my dad, my um, adopted father, yes. was able to connect me back again with my parents. Wow. Then my dad came for my wedding. And we were all dancing, celebrating, and he just disappeared. People were asking, where's my dad? Where's my dad? Where's my dad? Where's my dad? Only for them to go and find him in the toilet. Mm. Crying, sobbing like a baby. Wow. And when I asked him, he was like, he just can't believe wow. that his daughter, wow. you know, would turn out this way. Wow. I've now become the breadwinner of the family. Mm. I am the first graduate mm. in the family. Wow. And then the entire wedding became so emotional yeah. again. We mm. went back crying, went back to tears, <laughs> and we're all just mushy mushy, you know. And then, uh, wow.